Okay, well, it's nice to be here in California, coming from, you know, Texas. I, I don't get over here that frequently, right? It's going to be a challenge, but, uh, but hopefully, I don't. I don't know. How do you do that? Ah. Well, we, we do have a, we do have something called the Red River Rivalry, which is a big football game between Oklahoma and Texas. And we just say in Texas that um, there's one reason why Texas doesn't fall off into the Gulf of Mexico, and that's because Oklahoma sucks. <laughs> okay. You know, everything's bigger and better in Texas. Just keep that in mind. Um, I didn't wear my cowboy boots today, but uh, I should have. Because around Paul, it's all a bunch of manure anyway. <laughs> okay. So I get, to, I get to, like, do, this is like speed dating. This is like trying to figure out Nash in 45 minutes. And, you know, with HCC, my job is to keep you from getting to HCC. And then, you know, there's been a lot of comments made about the significant progression of liver cancer therapy in the past year and a half. That ain't got nothing on Nash. Nash is, is, is really revolutionizing the way that we're approaching it, both diagnostically, learning epidemiology, and then therapeutic treatment modalities. You know, with hepatitis C, those of us that focused on fatty liver were kind of like, you know, the nerds that just kind of hid in the background while the hep C gods ruled the planet. And, and now, now that we have cures for hep C, I'm sure, uh, as you've already heard, uh, that Lord of the Rings eyeball has shifted, and now we're graced with the opportunity to find new and revolutionizing therapies for the treatment of NASH. So I'm going to spend the majority of my time on that, but I have uh, been told to cover quite a bit in this talk, so we're going to get going. My disclosures are here. I basically work with everybody, so I'm not conflicted. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it's amazing. In my 29 years in the military, I really couldn't work with anybody. And then I retired two and a half years ago, and now, now it's like they turned the hounds loose. Uh, so we're going to briefly go through epidemiology. Novel non-invasive test. This has a cool uh, acronym called NITS, non-invasive test. We're only going to hit two in the, for the sake of time that were presented at AA. We're going to talk about two abstracts on healthcare utilization and health economics for those of you that have an interest in that. And the bulk of our time, we're going to focus on future therapies. Epidemiology. This was not data that was presented at WASLD. However, since it's my own data, I'm going to put the liberty of presenting this to you. And this is an abstract for easel. And hopefully, it'll be a publication in a nice peer-reviewed journal here short, shortly. But this is a project I worked on for five years, looking at the prevalence of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and NAFLD. One thing you'll learn about NAFLD is there's lots of people that can quote prevalence data around the world using liver enzymes, right upper quadrant ultrasound, fiber scan, MRI. But there's nobody that can quote the prevalence of NASH because nobody does prospective liver biopsies. So we represent the only study that's done that in the world and likely will ever be done. And the way we did that is we took people presenting for routine colon cancer screening. They came in mean age 56. They weren't bleeding. They were just there for routine colon cancer screening. And I asked them, hey, man, do you want to know your liver health? You're here for your colon health. Why not check out your liver health? And they all said, doc, my liver's fine. I said, okay, prove it. And so they signed consent. We did fiber scan with CAP, MR, PDFF. We did MR elastography. And we did a novel MRI called a multiparametric MRI, a corrected T1 liver multi-scan. If any of those were abnormal, guess what they got? Yeah, they got a liver biopsy, or at least they were offered a liver biopsy. Even being in the military, I couldn't demand that they do a liver biopsy, <laughs> at least supposedly. But ultimately, we asked them if they did. Here's data on 532 of those people that underwent all of the imaging studies and subsequently 245 that underwent liver biopsy. And I think in, in what you can see is that most of these people are obese, mean age is uh, around 56, half male, half female, 14% prevalence of diabetes, and the overall prevalence of fatty liver, 33% by MRI-PDFF, which is the gold standard. Interestingly, you stick a needle in those livers, 17.7% of them have NASH. 
That is the real prevalence of NASH, at least in San Antonio, and I venture to say it's probably similar to here. Now, that differs widely from what you read in the literature, and it's because the literature takes in all comers, and it really looks at NHANES data, elevated LFTs, fatty liver, and a presumptive diagnosis of NASH. This is liver biopsy proven. Now, I'm not here to tell you this is the national prevalence of NASH. If you're 20 years old, it's not that high. If you're 90 years old, it's not that high. But if you're in the sweet spot, middle age, like Pacros, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I said. That's it right there. Now, what about severity? So, so I powered this study to find 100 NASH patients. That's why it took me five years. But if you break down those 100 NASH patients, I think the most interesting, compelling part of this is 35% of them had F2 and F3 disease. That means 35% of the people diagnosed with NASH walked into our colon cancer screening clinic thinking they had a completely healthy liver, walked out with moderate to advanced liver disease. Now, what is the role of diabetes here? As you go from F0 to F2, 3, the prevalence of diabetes rises dramatically. And this is in line with what we know. 70% of diabetics have fatty liver. 46% of them have NASH if you stick a needle in their liver. And a lot of those tend to be more advanced, as you see from this slide. So that's a lot that we've learned. And guess what? That's all I have time for to talk about epidemiology. So we're going to move on to non-invasive test. So ultimately, when we talk about liver biopsy, look, you, you go to a barber, you get a haircut. You go to a hepatologist, man, we want to stick a needle in your liver. Some people call it a harpoon. In Texas, it's a big fat 14 gauge needle and we make two passes, amen? In other parts of the world, it's an 18 gauge because you know, they're not quite as bold. That's okay. But liver biopsy is not optimal as a first line diagnostic. It causes pain, it can cause mortality, it can, you can hit the lung, kidney, gallbladder, or colon. There are issues associated with biopsy and you know, it's a whole lot cooler to do a colonoscopy than it is a liver biopsy. So ultimately, there's only about 60,000 liver biopsies done annually, and there's about 100 million Americans with fatty liver. Well, Houston, we have a problem. So how are we going to get around finding these people? Of the 100 million Americans, there's about 20 to 25 million with NASH. NASH is a disease that can progress to cirrhosis and liver cancer. So we got to do better. And, and that's ultimately what drove us to find some of these non-invasive tests. So showing you what that looks like. This is called NIS4. NIS4 is a compilation of a MR34A, which is a microRNA, alpha-2 macroglobulin, HbA1c, and something that I uh, discovered, YKL40. And when you put those together, and this was presented at, at uh, AASLD, and it was done by GenFit. This is a company that's studying a drug in phase three for NASH. We'll talk about that briefly later. But looking at their phase two trial, that was their derivation set or their training set. And they saw that when they used these four markers, they got an ROC of 0.81, which is pretty good. Actually, it's very good. And then they validated it in their ongoing phase three trial prospectively and saw a very similar AUC. And then they pooled the data and you had an ROC of 0.82 which is pretty good. Now, how does that break down into different stages in the NAFLD activity score? You see the box plots kind of line up pretty nicely. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the line in the middle is the mean, and there are clear di differentiations between the mean for fibrosis stage. For NAS, not so much different between uh, zero and three, but begins to clearly separate between NASs of four and five and everything below that. So ultimately, this this group of biomarkers was designed differently than FIB4 and NAFLD fibrosis score. So those two scoring systems were designed to find NASH patients with advanced liver disease, F3 and F4. This non-invasive test is designed to find people that have NASH with an NAS of 4 or more and F2 or greater fibrosis. So really what it's trying to find are people that can enroll in NASH clinical trials. The FDA is looking exactly for this patient population. In fact, drugs that reach the market first will likely be FDA approved for this population of patients. NASH, NASO4, stage two, or greater fibrosis. So it's different than the, the FIB4 and NAFLD fibrosis score, but what you see here when you compare the ROCs to all the other tests, you see that it, it just performs better. 
So there's another one out there. This was presented by Phil Newsom. I was also uh, happy to be a part of this. <clears throat> and this looks at FibroScan. So how many in here have a FibroScan? Okay, so I have a FibroScan. And for me, it's a six vital sign. I use it as part of my routine clinical practice. In fact, I will not see a patient. My staff knows don't put the patient in the room until they've had a fiber scan. I get their height, weight, I get their blood pressure, and I get a fiber scan. To me, it's incredibly important. Why? The negative predictive value of that test is about 95%. That's where I use it. 100 million Americans with fatty liver, 25 million with NASH. That means 75 million can go away and go back to primary care. They're going to grow old with their liver disease. So I want to find those. I want to do the 80% solution and get rid of people I don't need to be following and then focus on those that I do. So I use it for that reason. So it's interesting to me that, that uh, we can use this test now prospectively to define the same population of patients that the NIST-4 did, and that's the, NAFL, the NASH patients with an NAS of 4 more with F2 or greater fibrosis. Now, this study was derived from seven centers in the UK. Ultimately, 335 patients were enrolled, and using VCTE, KPA, plus CAP, plus AST, you found an ROC of 0.83. And when you look very closely at Uden's index, which is a Really, it's a marker of accuracy. It tells you the best sensitivity and specificity for the test. You see that there are two different cut points you can utilize. Now, for any test that's developed as a non-invasive, if you want to optimize sensitivity and specificity, you have two different cut points. You have a low cut point and you have a high cut point. And the reason for that is you want to optimize sensitivity. So you pick a low cut point to say, you don't have disease, you can leave my office and feel very good. You want to have a high cut point to define the optimal specificity. You have disease. Houston, we have a problem. The problem with any one of these tests is there's a piece in the middle called indeterminate. And with Fib4 and Affled Fibrosis score, on average, it's about 30%. So, you know, you optimize here for 0.4 or less, very, very good at excluding disease, 0.76 or greater, very, very good at finding disease. So how does this stack up? Well, ultimately, this derivation cohort was then validated in an Asian population from Malaysia, in a U.S. cohort from San Antonio, that would be mine, and then a French bariatric surgery cohort, and you found, particularly for the U.S. cohort, an even improved ROC of 0.91. Now, using the two different cut points I talked about, 0.4 and 0.76, we can optimize our negative and positive predictive value in the box that you see here. But more importantly, we can limit the gray zone, the indeterminate zone, to only 12%. So how does that stack up to NAFL fibrosis score in Fib4? I put those two in orange below the blue box for, the, uh, for what we call FAST, FibroScan plus AST. And you see when you look at Fib4, the ROC is 0.69 with a gray zone of about 27%. In NAFL fibrosis score, it's 0.7 with the ROC and about 42% of patients nobody knows what to do with. So when you stack it up that way, it looks very, very attractive. In fact, I can tell you prospectively in clinic, I use this tool every day long before this came out for clinical trial development in NASH. Most protocols that have my name on them will have a pre-screen strategy with FibroScan where I look at a cap of 300, a KPA of 8.5, and an AST greater than 20. If you do that, you define a population that has exactly what we're looking for here, NASH, NAS of four more with F2 and greater fibrosis. The KPA 8.5. Yeah. Look, you can't slow me down, man. I'm on a roll. All right, healthcare, you, there's a time for Q&A at the end, right? Didn't you build that in? Okay. Healthcare utilization and health economics. I got two little uh, vignettes to show you here. The first one is a longitudinal analysis of comorbidities and healthcare costs among NAFLD NASH patients. And here, just to set the overview for you, uh, this was a retrospective cohort study that looked at claims data. 44 million Americans, a quarter million with NAFLD and NASH from 08 to 16. And ultimately, this is a breakdown of the patient selection. So of those 40, almost 45 million Americans, at the very bottom, 312 had fatty liver. And interestingly, a couple tidbits come out of this. If you look at the total patient population, only 0.1% were diagnosed with NAFLD and NASH. And you might say to yourself, self, that's really low. What's going on? Well, look at the next line. The majority of those patients 
with first cirrhosis diagnosis already had decompensated disease. These patients are not presenting until they are jaundiced, have ascites, and come to the emergency room. Okay, that, that is the biggest piece of information I can show you from this data set is we are doing a horrible job of finding fatty liver patients. Horrible job. We're waiting until they're too late to do something about them and they present to the ED. So if you look at the baseline characteristics of these guys, they're pretty similar. Um, overall, NAFL to NASH, more than half are female, uh, mean age around 50. And if you look at cryptogenic, decompensated, liver cancer, liver transplantation, the only thing that really stands out to me is guys have more liver cancer and are transplanted more frequently than females. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, about the same. Now, I just want, this is a busy slide. I'm only, I only want to, everybody asks me, well, how frequently is diabetics, uh, diabetes found in NAFLD NASH patients? How frequently is hyperlipidemia? Well, here it is. You know, you've got 300,000 patients and you can look at the data. Now, there's a caveat to that. This is data really confined to a decompensated patient population, a liver transplant population, and a liver cancer population, because the vast majority of these people aren't presenting with just a little bit of fatty liver and NASH by the time they're diagnosed. However, 40% are hypertensive, you know, 40% are hyperlipidemic, diabetes 21 to 41% of the time, and, and ultimately, if you look at those with three or more comorbidities across the board, 16 to 41%. So what about healthcare costs? This is not a, you know, a hard piece of math to wrap your brain around. Um, but ultimately, we know the healthcare delivery cost for patients with fatty liver is rising. That would be the bottom blue line, which over a five-year uh, time point, the average cost has gone up to about $100,000, cumulative annual all-cause healthcare cost. That's just a fatty liver patient. Now, you just look up the screen there, and you can see all the way to liver transplant at the top, 391,000. But interestingly, the, the green and the purple line define a patient with decompensated disease and liver cancer, and essentially their health care costs are the same, just below that of a liver transplant patient. So if you're looking for claims data, you're looking for health care utilization costs to define whether or not we should have an approved therapy for NASH, here it is. This is, this is the data that's going to be used by payers to define how much they're gonna reimburse somebody for you to write a prescription for NASH. Okay, let's look at some real world data from Medicare claims. So this is a retrospective observ observational cohort study, 20% of the US Medicare sample. There were five cohorts, those with NAFLD and NASH, the same set I just showed you, those with cryptogenic cirrhosis, decompensated disease, liver transplant, and liver cancer. And here, I just want you to focus on the boxes below. Um, you know, 2.4% of Medicare patients in the study had NAFLD and NASH. And if you look across the line, again, what stands out is the DCC group, the decompensated cirrhosis group, and that is the majority of patients as they present through Medicare, they've already decompensated. So it's, it's, really, it's really a big problem. Now, if you look at Kaplan-Meier survival analysis, it's no it's no news to you in this room that, that liver cancer is the top gray line. Um, patients still don't survive very long with liver cancer. What I find interesting is the bottom black line, and this is NAFL to NASH patients, and over eight years of follow-up, about 12.6% of them die. And we know that fatty liver disease, 38% of the reason they die is from cardiovascular disease, about 15% is non-liver-related malignancy, and about 9% is due to liver-related disease. However, from this study, what we found is that mortality rate is definitely increased in NAFLD and NASH patients. It's 26.3 when you just look cumulatively overall at a NAFLD and NASH population, compared to 12.7% in the general population. So it's more than twofold increased risk of death if you have NAFLD and NASH. And we know that it increases with liver disease progression, and that just is common sense. Okay, moving on to current therapies. Where are we at today? 2018, we are on the cusp of new FDA-approved treatment. However, we're not there yet, so what can you use? Well, you can't use metformin. I guess you could, but you don't want to. It doesn't work in NASH patients. 
What about pioglitazone? Works like a charm. I'll show you data on the next slide that advocates for that. However, there are warts associated with pioglitazone that preclude me from using it in my clinical practice, mainly weight gain. And it's not just fat weight, fat weight it's water weight. And what we know from NAFLD patients is they have stiffer right ventricles. And when you have a stiff right ventricle and you flood it with water, what happens? Heart failure, right-sided heart failure. And that's why you have a black box warning on this drug. So that's what gives me pause to use it. I'll show you a little data on loriglutide. This drug is not being carried forward to treat NASH. However, you have it in your clinical practice. It's called Victoza. And its sister drug, semaglutide, I'll show you some amazing data on, and it is being used in NASH clinical trial development. And finally, vitamin E at doses of 800 IUs or 1,000 IUs, as long as it's RRR alpha tocopherol, the naturally occurring vitamin E, you can use it in a non-serotic, non-diabetic patient and feel pretty decent about the results that you will achieve. How decent? Well, here's the Pivens trial data published in New England Journal in 2010. If you look at vitamin E in yellow compared to placebo in blue, and you look all the way to the right on NASH resolution, you see a statistically significant benefit of 800 IUs of vitamin E over placebo. So why the heck do I see patients on 400 of vitamin E? Okay, that makes no sense to me, right? You know, you'd think if 800 works, 1,000 would be better, not if 800 works, okay, let's give them 400. It, it's not the way it works. So if you see people on 400 IUs of vitamin E, please either double the dose or take them off of the drug. If they're a diabetic and they have cirrhosis, there's no data that using vitamin E is effective. So you need to be aware of that as well. But if you look at pioglitazone here, man, the drug looks really good. It looks really good. In fact, data, um, I don't have the additional slide here. I took it out for the sake of time. Ken Cousy's actually looked at this even closer in 18 months of therapy and shows a 51% resolution of NASH with pioglitazone compared to about 12% for placebo. So it's even better data than what Pivens showed. But again, remember, there are warts with the drug. So what does that tell me as a drug developer in NASH? I like the mechanism. PPARs are a good way to go about tacking this disease. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Find a drug that doesn't have the side effects associated with it in the same mechanism of action category. Now, how about loriglutide? This was a small study published in The Lancet. And ultimately, if you look over here, 39% of people resolved NASH to 9% that, uh, that were on placebo. And there was a nice drop in ALT. And so that made sense to me. The problem is this is a teeny weeny study. It was only for six months and the company didn't move forward with its development. However, this was presented at AASLD, and it's the sister drug, semaglutide. Okay, this is also a injectable once daily, and they looked at different doses of sema. Focus your attention on the red bar. That's the 0.4 milligram. That is likely to be what's studied in NASH patients and what is likely to show us our biggest benefit. So I show you data from a post hoc analysis uh, in patients that were studied for diabetes, where this drug was given to diabetics to look for drop in A1C, but they looked at people that had an abnormal ALT as defined by greater than 19 for a woman and 30 for a man. So if you look at the change in body weight first, if you get to the 0.4 milligram, patients are losing on average 14% of their body weight with one year of treatment. Now, Paul didn't give me enough time to talk about current standard of care for NASH outside of pharmacotherapy, but diet and weight loss still remains king, and 10% is the magic number you need to hit. The problem is only 10% of those patients can actually hit the 10% number. That's why the biggest loser has no reunion. <laughs> right. So, having said that, when you look at ALT normalization, and you go all the way out to that 0.4 dose that had the magical 13.8% weight loss, that's where we saw 46% of people normalizing ALT. Looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. This drug is currently completed enrollment in a very large phase two trial. The problem is it's 18 months in duration, so it'll be a little bit of time before we have the phase two results. Having said that, Victoza is readily available and it would be an, an off-target indication, but in the right setting where you have a diabetic, it actually might also help their underlying fatty liver disease. So what can you do today? You can treat their metabolic syndrome and reduce their CVD risk. 
Have you guys seen the data from on Vicepa, Amarin, looking at a 30% reduction in triglycerides actually being linked to a reduction in cardiovascular outcomes? So that's what we can do here is we can try to reduce triglycerides as well, as well as the other things that are listed. You can give liver-directed treatment with vitamin E, pioglitazone, or maybe Victoza. You can, I don't think this was mentioned in the previous talk, but I'm a huge, huge advocate. For years now, I've managed the liver tumor board at Brook Army Medical Center for a long time before I retired, and I loved using metformin and a statin. In fact, we would resect patients, we would Y90 them, we would taste them, and then they would get put on metformin and Lipitor and dosed until their LDL was essentially nothing. Two, five, 10, didn't matter. I mean, what did the patient have to lose, right? So we dosed them high, and the patients did incredibly well, incredibly well. Our mean life expectancy was three times that of the national average. There's plenty, plenty, plenty of, post, uh, of cross-sectional data showing that patients on metformin and patients on a statin have less liver cancer. Now, there's no prospective randomized controlled trial showing that, but we have lots of data. From the VA, we have a very nice study showing that as well. So I do that in these patients. And we, we target lifestyle change. Four words on lifestyle change, that's all I have time for. Eat less, run more. Okay, emerging treatment options. So this is a, a very busy slide, but it speaks to all the different pathways that are being targeted to try to go after this disease. Fatty liver is a wastebasket terminology. There's a hundred different ways to get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If you target one pathway, you're gonna have effect on some patients, but maybe the other patients are really getting NASH through a different pathway. So there's going to be combination therapy at the end of the day that's used to treat most of these patients. We're not to the point yet where we have combination therapy in phase three trials, so I'm going to show you individual therapeutic options that eventually will be combined with others. Now, one thing about drug development that I'm disappointed in in NASH is people are taking drugs that don't work or don't work very well and combining them with other drugs that don't work or don't work very well in hopes that two drugs that don't work individually will have an incredible response when you put the two together. Uh, my idea is you take two drugs that work really well together, that have synergistic mechanisms of action, and then you see what happens. But it is what it is. So diving into this, we have four drugs in five phase three clinical trials. And I'll, I'll go in order very quickly of where these are. So beta-cholic acid is an FXR agonist. That means this drug downregulates bile acid production by its main mechanism of action. That happens through upregulation of FGF19. And FGF19 is a hormone that prevents the conversion of cholesterol to bile acids. So what happens when you prevent the conversion of cholesterol to bile acids? You have more cholesterol, so LDL goes up, okay? That's fine, because you can give a statin and you very rapidly mitigate the LDL rise. Uh, some people question using another drug to treat another drug, but ultimately, my view is if the juice is worth the squeeze, it might be reasonable to take that approach. A beta-cholic acid did a study called the Flint trial preceding this, rat, this large phase three trial that actually showed a benefit in both fibrosis and in NASH resolution. It's the only drug out there that showed that benefit so far. Beta-cholic acid has now completed enrollment of its phase three subpart H approvable cohort. All that means is that they're waiting on reporting that data to the FDA then they'll file the NDA, and ideally, ideally, you might have an FDA-approved drug for NASH by this time next year. May shift over into first quarter 2020, but it may be in fourth quarter of 2019. So what's right behind that? This ASK1 inhibitor by Gilead is also right behind that. They have two studies, one in cirrhotics and one in F3 patients. Both are fully enrolled. The Stellar 4 trial is finishing its last liver biopsy this month. They'll assimilate the data, maybe a late breaker at easel. They'll submit it to the FDA. They usually have six months from the time you file. And you also might have this drug available. It's a little bit of a stretch, but I would say first quarter 2020 if it's, a found, if it's found to be effective. This drug is being studied not for its NASH effect, but for its antifibrotic effect. The phase two trial showed no effect on NASH, but it did show a dose response relationship on fibrosis. 
However, there's one caveat. It was not studied in cirrhotics, but yet they did a very large phase three trial in cirrhotics. There's a little bit of a, a roll of the dice there, I would say. You don't have data in phase two in cirrhotics and you're just gonna take it to stage three, to phase three, it's, it's a little bit of a roll of the dice. So uh, maybe we do have more data in stellar three than we do in four. Elafibrinor, this is GenFit's drug, dose of 120 milligrams in the Golden 505 trial showed a significant improvement on NASH relative to placebo, did not work on fibrosis. So completely the opposite of ASK1, this drug works on NASH, not necessarily on fibrosis as its main endpoint. That drug is also fully enrolled for its subpart H approval. We won't be done with that study till this time next year. This time next year. So then they have to assimilate the data, submit it to the FDA. So it's about one year behind that of Solancertib and a beta cholic acid. And then finally, Sinecrivirox, CCR25 antagonist in phase two, showed a marginal benefit in fibrosis, nothing on NASH, and it's currently enrolling in phase three and has a bit of a ways to go. So I'm gonna shift to the exciting stuff, right? This is like, this is like stuff that, that you know, I get all geeked out about. This is, this is really cool. I don't have time to go through a ton. There's a lot more than this. I'm just gonna breeze through this very quickly. The yellow asterisks are paired liver biopsy studies. The FDA absolutely mandates paired liver biopsy data before you go to phase three. What does that mean? Very simple. It means that the three drugs you see listed here that have asterisks behind them are the closest to phase three. All the others still need to do paired liver biopsy studies and then go to phase three. Now, when you look at this, I'm gonna set the stage for you very quickly. We wanna see drops in ALT. There's never been a NASH resolution that did not associate with a drop in ALT. There's also never been a NASH resolution that didn't occur in the setting of fat loss. They all had to lose fat. So ALT and MRI PDFF are very important indicators to look at when you look at these phase two trials. What's the magic number? Well, it's 30% relative reduction in both. If you drop ALT by 30%, relatively speaking, that's associated with improvement in biopsy. If you drop the PDFF by 30%, that's also associated with improvement in biopsy. So that's what I want you to think about as we move forward. Where do each of these drugs fall when compared to that standard? We'll start with the FGF21 agonist that BMS has now in phase 2B. Okay, they're in phase 2B, doing paired liver biopsy studies. However, this is not the study that I'm presenting. It's the earlier phase, phase 2A trial. It's a 16-week trial. All they did was PDFF at the beginning and at the end and MR elastography. The MR elastography data I'm not showing today. I'm just focused on the PDFF. Now, this is absolute change. So what I didn't show you before is a 5% absolute reduction correlates with a 30% relative reduction. So looking at this slide, the one in red, the 10 milligram daily, kind of hit that, right? 6.8, it's better than five. So that looked attractive. The once weekly dose, 20, didn't quite, eh, maybe, maybe got to that number, but just barely. When you look at ALT, focus on the red. The red is the 10 milligram daily, and I'm looking at that minus 30 line. And you're hitting it with the red, you're not hitting it with the once weekly 20, and if you look at AST, the same thing. So for me, I, I tend to be more excited about the 10 than the 20. The 20 is what got carried forward into phase 2B. Okay, what about acetyl-CoA carboxylase inhibition? There are three ways to get fat in the liver. The most common way is you have a dysfunctional fat cell. And that dysfunctional fat cell, because of insulin resistance, takes free fatty acids and shoots them out in the portal vein and they get taken up in the liver. And free fatty acids in the liver or a lot like the special forces being in Iraq, okay? You, you know, they go there for one reason, to be disruptive and to cause problems and to solve problems. Having spent 29 years in the military, I saw a lot of those guys and you, you want them on your side, believe me. Um, but in liver disease with free fatty acids, these guys commit hairy carry when they enter the liver. And so the liver has two mechanisms to immediately deal with them. They can burn them through beta oxidation of fatty acids. Good thing, we love beta oxidation of fatty acids. In fatty liver disease, that mechanism is downregulated. We do a bad, bad job of burning fatty acids. So the other way to get rid of that poisonous fatty acid is to esterify it into triglycerides. 
And when you look at a liver biopsy slide, that's the big white fat globules that you see. It's inert, it doesn't hurt the liver. So that's the other way that you can deal with it. The liver also makes fat through de novo lipogenesis. It's a, the second most common reason to get fatty liver. The third most common is you just eat a lot of fat, okay? But in order of putting fat in the liver, eating, then de novo lipogenesis, then the big daddy, which is free fatty acid flux from, from adipocytes. This drug hits the middle one, de novo lipogenesis. It blocks de novo lipogenesis by blocking acetyl-CoA conversion to malonyl-CoA. So how well does it work? The 20 milligram dose, 28.9% improvement in fat reduction relatively. Remember the magic number? 30. Okay, well, we're a little close, all right? So they said, okay, well, let's look at the percentage of our patients that actually hit that magic 30, and it was 48% with the middle dose. So when we look at relative change in ALT, again, we're looking for that magic 30. The middle dose comes close, but not quite there. Now, there's also a wart on this drug and every acetyl-CoA carboxylase inhibitor, and that is a bump in triglycerides. And it can be high. It can be high. Several of these patients had bumps over 1,000. It was mitigated with fish oil or ephibrate or by stopping the drug, but it is something that has to be considered when using this type of drug. Pfizer also has one under development. Merck had one and decided not to take it forward. Now, this drug is not being carried forward by Gilead, to my understanding, as a monotherapy. It is, however, being combined with other drugs in their pipeline. Now, I'm going to move forward to NGM-282. This is data I presented at AASLD, and I presented it also at EASL. So I'm going to show you a compilation of what I presented at EASL and what I presented at AASLD. If Paul will give me that liberty, he said post-AASLD update. That still is kind of post-EASL, right? It's, it's still post-post. So we're going to show you that data too. This is pretty exciting stuff. So it's only a 12-week trial. But what happened, this data was published in The Lancet back in February, is when you dose FGF19, you rapidly and profoundly drop liver fat and drop ALT. So the idea was if you're dropping liver fat and ALT significantly, why not do liver biopsies? Well, I'm from Texas. I'm a cowboy. I'll do 12-week liver biopsies in patients. And I get asked all the time, Doc, why would you do 12-week liver biopsies and put them to that risk? And I said, well, you know, does the risk of a liver biopsy change today or in one year? No, it's the same. Okay, that's why I did it at 12 weeks, because I had enough data non-invasively to suggest there was a benefit. So I'll show you uh, if there is a benefit. So ultimately, you, when you do drug development, you want to find a biomarker that you can say that drug hits its target and is doing what it's supposed to do. Remember, this drug blocks CYP7A1, which is the rate-limiting enzyme that converts cholesterol to bile acids. I can't measure CYP7A1 very well, but it has, a, it has a, an analog called C4 that I can readily measure in blood. So if I'm blocking C4, I know I'm having an effect on the conversion of cholesterol to bile acids. It's, hitting, it's doing its job. So how well does this drug block C4? Uh, pretty much knocks it all the way out, either with the one milligram or the three milligram, and you see the compensatory drop in serum bile acids with both doses. Now, when we look at liver fat content, the three milligram dose I presented at Easel in April, and with that dose, you saw probably a little bit better drop in liver fat content than you did with the one milligram dose. Maybe a better way to look at it is in table form over here on the right where the absolute drop was roughly the same, almost 11% for both. And if you look down here at the bottom, you're really targeting that percentage of people that hit the 30% relative reduction, and you see 100% of them did in the three milligram and 88% did with the one milligram. In fact, two thirds of people completely normalized liver fat in 12 weeks with this drug, and one third did with the one milligram dose. So that is the reason why I said, let's do liver biopsies. But you might say, doc, I'm not convinced. Give me some ALT data. Okay, well, here you go. I knew you wanted to ask that question, and so I provide it for you here. The three milligram dose rapidly and profoundly dropped ALT, in fact, to the tune of 53 points very quickly, and the one milligram dose did it as well, 62 points, and the relative drop in ALT was over 60% for both. So in my mind, there was a compelling argument to do liver biopsies at 12 weeks, and ultimately, um, that is, that's what we did. So here is the data. One milligram on the left, three milligrams on the right. 
If you look at improvement in the NAFLD activity score, which is a composite of steatosis, inflammation, and ballooning, 75% of people with one milligram did it, 84% with a three milligram did it. Um, and there was one or two patients that worsened at the bottom there in the purple. So what about fibrosis? Well, I'm only showing the one milligram, but I'll speak to the three as well. In this trial, 25% of patients improved fibrosis at 12 weeks. One patient had a two-stage two improvement. With a three milligram dose, 42% of patients improved fibrosis at 12 weeks. Three patients had a two-stage improvement. So it seems to me like the three might be slightly better than the one at 12 weeks. We don't know how well the one would do if you continued to treat patients. We know the side effect profile is slightly better for the one and the three, and that's basically related to GI issues. So nausea, a little belly pain. You almost don't see any with the one. You see it a little bit with the three and loose stools as well. So the next step here is 24 week paired liver biopsies and the one and the three are being carried forward with that study. So moving on to the non-steroidal FXR agonist, GS9674. Now, I talked about obeta-cholic acid. That is a bile acid FXR. And you know from the, golden, from the Flint trial that it improved both fibrosis and NASH on biopsy. That is the drug that's likely to be first across the finish line for FDA approval. Now, we have a slight variation on the FXR. This is a non-bile acid FXR thought to maybe not have as much bump in LDL, maybe not have as much pruritus associated with it, and the hope is very similar efficacy. So this study was presented in poster format by a colleague of mine um, at AASLD, and you see the numbers, about 130 patients in a two to two to one randomization. This was not biopsy driven. There was MRI and MRE done to define a population that likely had NASH. The primary endpoint, again, was change in um, liver fat content. So ultimately, if you look at how well it did, you see uh, at, uh, at 24 weeks of treatment with 100 milligram dose, you had about a 22.7% relative improvement in fat. And if you look at the percentage of people that had that 30% uh, reduction, about 38%. So it's a little bit um, in line with what we saw with the acetyl-CoA carboxylase inhibitor. So what about ALT drop? And, and here, it, it was a little bit less than a 20% relative drop. There was a profound drop in GGT, which we know is linked to oxidative stress. So what about Madrigal? So Madrigal is a thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist. So set the stage for you, people with fatty liver disease are hypothyroid. About 30% of them are on Synthroid or some other treatment for their hypothyroidism. And we know that in the livers, they're also relatively hypothyroid. So the thyroid makes thyroid in the form of T4. It goes to the liver and gets converted to its active metabolite T3. And T3 does what? It helps mitochondria function and it helps beta oxidation of fatty acids, which is exactly what's not working well in NAFLD patients. So having said that, what do we know uh, about this drug? Well, this was a, a nine month study with paired liver biopsies. But the primary endpoint was change in fat at 12 weeks. That data was presented at EASL and it showed a very positive effect. What I presented at WSLD was the liver biopsy data. But I'll re remind you of the PDFF change and you can see here um, on the right, the MRI PDFF relative change in fat hit that magic 30% number. And there was also a 40% relative reduction in ALT. And so what did that mean on liver biopsy? Well. Uh, if you looked mainly at NASH, and I think that's just for the sake of time what I'm going to move to, 27.4% of patients resolved NASH, 6% uh, actually in the placebo group. If you look at the MRI responders, so this is where I'm getting to this data. If you looked at the group of people that had a 30% relative reduction in fat and said, okay, how did they do with NASH resolution? It was actually 39% of them resolved NASH compared to 6% for placebo. So this is one of the first studies that shows that that MRI PDFF actually is consistent with resolution of NASH. Now it also improved lipid profiles as you would expect with this type of drug, not only with LDL, but also significantly with triglycerides and lipo little a and ApoB. So it's, there's another drug 
that was presented at AASLD that's also a thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist. This is a prodrug. It doesn't actually become active until it gets into the liver, and it also is thought to be liver specific. You don't want to have any alpha activity in this setting because that causes tachycardia and hypertension, and so early drugs in this class were killed because of that. But these two drugs are thought to be relatively liver specific. And so how well did this drug do? Well, it was studied in about 45 patients with NAFLD. They didn't have biopsy-proven NASH, but you see significant effects on fat reduction. In fact, 90% of people with a high dose achieved that 30% reduction in liver fat. So that was very positive. We don't have any more data from that drug. They haven't done any liver biopsy studies and haven't studied NASH patients to date. So I'll end with this one. This is the, um, the ARREST trial. This was a, a drug called a RAMCOL. It's a first-in-class novel synthetic fatty acid bile acid conjugate. It inhibits the activity of SCD1, and ultimately what that does is it increases um, or improves insulin re resistance and reduces fatty acid synthesis. So it's a, it's a good thing for the liver. This was a very large trial in my world, about 270 patients, 52-week uh, treatment with paired liver biopsies, and ultimately what they showed was about 30% of people achieved the magic 30% relative reduction. So, you know, that's not going to set the world on fire. That's not that dramatic. Um, but if you um, look at the percent of people that had uh, greater than 5% absolute reduction from baseline, 47%. So maybe a little bit better than the 30%. Both of these should be analogous to each other. So I'm surprised they're that big of a difference between the two. Suffice it to say, I'm a believer that it's about 30% achieved that magic number. So what did that do to NASH? Well, 16.7% versus 5% uh, is what we saw. So again, it was a positive impact. The odds ratio was very significant. However, again, it didn't set the world on fire. Uh, but it did have some effects potentially on preventing patients from progressing to cirrhosis. And I highlight on the right here, six patients in placebo versus one patient in the high-dose arm move forward to cirrhosis. So maybe, maybe this drug has an effect. It is moving into phase three in 2019. So if, I, if you didn't pay attention to anything I just told you, I put it all together so you could just take a picture of this or summarize it in your brain, and I draw the line at 30% relative reduction, and I say, who hit that target? It was Lariglotide, the GLP-1 agonist called Victoza, it was the FGF21, it was the Madrigal thyroid hormone drug, it was the Viking thyroid hormone drug, it was the Gilead acetyl-CoA carboxylase inhibitor, and it was NGM's FGF19. Having said that, what's moving forward into phase three right now? Moving into forward in 2019, Madrigal's drug will go to phase three. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what else on here? Uh, NGM282 will go to phase 2B, Viking still needs to do a 2B trial. BMS is currently underway with a phase 2B trial. Um, and then this drug is used in combination with other Gilead drugs. So on the list here, the one that's moving forward is MGL3196 into phase three in 2019. Oh, I'm sorry, SCD1, a RAM call and a rest is also moving into phase three. So what about last slide, NASH resolution? Uh, which this is placebo effect, and it ranges from 20% down to about 5%. I'll caution you, these aren't apples to apples comparisons. The definition of NASH resolution by the FDA has changed over the past four or five years. But right now we believe that placebo has about a 5 to 6% effect in NASH resolution trials. So drug effect, what we see here, pioglitazone, still the best out there so far, and weight loss are still the best but other drugs are currently in development. And this is where I get to combination therapies. I think we're going to need to, to have those. So with that, I'll wrap up. I'm a little bit over, sorry.